Hi guys, welcome back to my channel. In this video, I am talking about Time is a Mother, the poetry collection by Ocean Vong. So it's no secret that I am a big fan of Vong as a writer. There are videos on this channel about Night Sky with Exit Wounds and On Earth We're Briefly Gorgeous. Side note, he is very good at titling his work. Those are all beautiful titles, including Time as a Mother. But I think Vong is this incredible writer that uh, has this really deep love of language itself, and he writes about pain and beauty and humor and reverence, and he finds these balances that are just always continually surprising to me. And I consider personally Vong to be one of a handful of writers writing right now that I have this sense of excitement to be kind of sharing a lifetime with them in that I get to see what they're writing right now and 10, 20, 30 years from now. Night Sky with Exit Wounds is one of my favorite poetry collections to date. So, you know, going into this collection, I already have certain expectations. And when this collection came out, I attended one of the stops of the book tour and heard Vong talk about his craft and all that went into this collection. And that was a really um, enlightening uh, conversation to get to hear as a reader and a writer. And I want to highlight that with this collection, and with a lot of poetry that I'm reading in adulthood, I'm making a very conscious choice to go slow, to take my time. And with poetry, uh, and especially with Vong's work, I think it's important to be patient with it, to let things sink in, to kind of read and reread. You know, yes, technically you can finish reading a single poetry collection, like, in a weekend, but for me it's not about kind of hitting a certain quota or number of books in a year. It's about the quality of the experience of reading that particular work. And I definitely felt like I got a lot from this collection. I got a lot out of the time that I put into it, and it's definitely something that I could return to and find a lot more. You know, there, there are depths to be explored, and that's the beauty and the fun of it. So if you read poetry and you just feel like it's not sinking in or it's going over your head, maybe just read it again. Go slower, take your time, take it in word by word, line by line. Okay, so to start with talking about this collection, I want to think about um, rhythm and structure and line breaks and all those kind of functional pieces that make poetry poetry. So at the reading that I attended, Vong talked about being bilingual, speaking English and Vietnamese, and how that affected the writing thematically and technically. So every language has kind of a a different natural rhythm, a prosody, the way the language moves, the way um, patterns emerge. You know, there's some interesting um, subtlety in thinking about languages comparatively and thinking about languages that are um, more dissimilar from English. And I think in some ways English is a pretty flexible language in that it, it can take on a lot of different tone and stress patterns and mold to a certain degree uh, to what you apply to it. And Vong talked about how in this collection he's writing primarily in English, but he's imposing a kind of Vietnamese uh, intonation pattern. So we think about like the prosody of Vietnamese. It's um, a monosyllabic language. It's a tonal language, meaning that tone and pitch affects meaning and sort of tonal contours carry meaning, which is kind of perfect for poetry because that is musicality, that is melody sort of inherent. 
So I think this is such a, a cool concept to try to bring into the writing of this work. And it also is carrying a lot of meaning, you know, meaning in how language dictates thought. So I did some reading about um, Vietnamese as a language linguistically as I was kind of moving through this collection. Uh, I do think it was helpful in kind of wrapping my head around those ideas that Vong presented at the reading. But as an English speaker, I think it's inevitably going to be difficult for me to really understand uh, a tonal language on a deep level just from like looking at academic papers. I would be really interested to hear how um, other readers who are bilingual speaking Vietnamese and English um, experience that aspect of the writing. I definitely encourage uh, readers to try to find some videos of Vong reading poems from this collection. They're definitely out there uh, to get a better idea of the, the rhythm and the tonal things that are happening there. I mean, really, you could write a whole paper just about this aspect alone. It's very interesting. There's also a lot of variety in the way things look on the page. There are kind of blocky prose poems and kind of, you know, um, left justified, uh, like single stanza poems, those that look kind of traditionally English. And there's also a lot of poems where you can see the lines kind of go back and forth and they're sort of like misaligned puzzle pieces or like a, a back and forth conversation. And those obviously feel um, less traditional in the way they look on the page. There's one poem uh, visually that I think is unique in this collection, um, Dear Tea which has a lot of um, nature imagery, you know, snow, wind, and it, it kind of has this look of like a wave moving across the page. It's like snow falling, a leaf falling. And I don't know, it's just beautiful to look at before you even get into the language. Like the enjambment and the line breaks and everything carry a lot of meaning in this collection. Um, there's one from the poem Ars Poetica as the Maker, which I'm going to read at the end of this video, um, where the line breaks right in the middle of the word god-awful, god, line break, awful. And the poem is thematically about, you know, creation, um, God as a creator and the artist as a creator, which is one example of a lot of instances like that that um, are really effective. And all of these mechanics, the, the line, the punctuation, all of it is done very intentionally as it should be in poetry. You know, every little detail is a decision made. And this collection offers a lot of variety in that way. So one central theme addressed in this collection is grief. Grief in this very big cultural generational sense and very intimate grief. Notably in the aftermath of the illness and passing of Vong's mother. So looking at the collection as a whole, the grief inserts itself and it, it shows up as a root over and over. And you see Vong coming back to these ideas again and again of the inability to save someone or turn back time, you know, what it means to kind of make someone immortal in the act of writing about them, you know, the, the act of trying to hold those people closer. And there's so much in this balance of the mundane and the grace in death and how they're right alongside each other. And the way Vong writes about these themes, it's really um, moving, very impactful for me as a reader. There's this one kind of um, quieter poem in the collection called Rise and Shine, where the speaker is going through 
a typical morning routine, but kind of everything that happens has this shadow, this haunting of this lost person. And the, the language that Vong uses is that their face is a thumbprint left by a god. It's um, marking even the most uninteresting aspects of a person's life. And there's this really um, astounding poem called Amazon History of a Former Nail Salon Worker, which is a list poem of um, orders from Amazon. And it kind of starts with nail technician things, and then you see all of these things connected to her son, and then you see through these orders, you know, cancer and going through treatment, and then her eventual death. And I don't know, it's just you see the moment where it's um, no longer about treatment, but um, acceptance. And gosh, it is just a knock you out kind of poem. I mean, I was kind of a mess after reading that one. And then in the second to last poem entitled Dear Rose, I think we kind of hit this really beautiful peak in the collection. I think this work is like a total masterpiece. It's this 10 page poem. It's addressing so many things. It's like this incredible tightrope act and there's these words and phrases and moments that it keeps cycling back to and you can feel the speaker trying to understand their mother, a complicated mother who the world was very harsh to, and trying so hard to do something good, to make something good in the name of this mother. Just the time in it, the, the act of preservation, all of that is in this poem. And I'm not going to spend any more time on Dear Rose uh, because, I mean, honestly, it's pointless for me to talk about it. But I will say um, that poem alone is worth buying the book. And you see um, this grief and loss leading into themes of rebirth. You know, the last few lines in this poem called Not Even I caved and decided it will be joy from now on. Then everything opened. The lights blazed around me into a white weather, and I was lifted, wet and bloody, out of my mother, into the world, screaming and enough. And that's all over this collection, too, this, this idea of, of choosing joy and choosing to live in the immediacy of your life now and kind of the, the grand beauty of living, which can only be appreciated in the context of limited time. This whole collection really has a lot to say about grief. There's a lot in this collection about um, being a writer, the, the act of writing, the um, desire to write at all and where it comes from, what writing does to memory and identity and relationships. Like I've, I've touched on, there's a lot in this collection about the act, this kind of like meta reflection on the act of writing about someone that you've loved and lost and kind of preserving them on the page and kind of the effort of trying to memorialize like a real version of them. There's one poem called um, Dear T that kind of takes a different slant on that where the speaker has this kind of um, desperation in the writing because the writing is not just to preserve this person but to like literally relive those moments to kind of steal back a day with this person that 
you'll never actually see again. And it's just this like heart achingly beautiful poem of the writer trying to remake um, this boy that they loved. And the creation of art and the grief are all tied together in this collection. You know, behind the books and the acclaim and the language itself, there is a real life and loves and history and people. So this collection writes about those people and those memories and also reflects on what is happening for the writer when they write about those things. And there's so much about um, how essential reading and writing and this love of language is to Vong, how that really um, brings him to life. It's healing and kind of um, a necessary part of living in that present moment and, you know, a continuation of the generational history that Vong writes about. I think that aspect of this collection, anyone who is a writer or an artist can certainly appreciate. So with poetry, I always like to read a little something. Um, so I'm going to read the poem Ars Poetica as the maker and starts with a quote from Genesis, and God saw the light and it was good. Because the butterfly's yellow wing flickering in black mud was a word stranded by its language. Because no one else was coming and I ran out of reasons. So I gathered fistfuls of ash, dark as ink, hammered them into marrow, into a skull thick enough to keep the gentle curse of dreams. Yes, I aimed for mercy, but came only close as building a cage around the heart, shudders over the eyes. Yes, I gave it hands, despite knowing that to stretch that clay slab into five blades of light, I would go too far because I too needed a place to hold me. So I dipped my fingers back into the fire, pried open the lower face until the wound widened into a throat, until every leaf shook silver with that god awful scream, and I was done, and it was human. So to start, I, I love the opening image of this poem, the butterfly in the mud a word stranded by its language. And this idea that someone has to come along and take that word and make it into something more. This whole poem is about um, to write is an act of creation. It's to breathe life into something that has a voice of its own. And I like this idea that um, it's not just for the sake of the piece, but there's, there's selfishness in the act that the writer needs something from it. And then there's just this idea that humans are created to create, that that is in itself inherently human. You know, there's a lot of humor in this collection, but there are also the these deeply serious kind of reverent moments that um, elevate things, like the, the tone of this is so divine. You know, that's definitely one of my favorites from the collection of the poems that were short enough to read on camera. <laughs> okay, so as I'm wrapping up, I want to emphasize again the importance of patience in reading poetry and reading a collection like this. Vong spent years uh, putting this collection together. He didn't rush the writing of it, and I don't think we should rush the reading of it either. You know, a lot of the poems in this collection are long, and they're balancing a lot of ideas, and they're going from one thing to the next. There's a lot of richness and a lot of layers that are worthy of time, worthy of exploring. So much of this collection is about time, and I think you should think about that when you're reading it. I'll also say this collection, it explores a lot of the same themes as 
on Earth were briefly gorgeous. There's a pretty big gap in between me reading them personally, but I imagine that they would work well as companions to read kind of back to back or maybe at the same time. If anyone has done that, I'd be really interested to hear about the experience. I think um, if I revisit this collection in like 10 years, I'm probably going to try to do that. But yeah, of course, this is a beautiful collection. Uh, Vong takes so much care in every little word and moment in his writing. You know, he just has that magical thing. Uh, he creates something that's hard to forget. So there's always more to be said, but I'm gonna leave it there for this video. Thank you so much for watching. I'll see you next time. Bye.